Beautiful. Thank you. I'm going to yep. be asking a lot of questions and I'm going to try to take notes. Yeah, for sure. I appreciate it. Um, well, awesome. I'm super stoked on this. <laughs> I guess I can give you a start by giving you a little bit of background as like really my main clientele or my main focus is volleyball athletes. Cool. So I'm a beach volleyball player. I work with a lot of like jumping athletes. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, obviously with volleyball, there's a lot of swinging. So um, I guess the first point that I'd be really interested in is uh, any like prehab exercises that you would recommend for like baseball players or volleyball players, anything like that to really strengthen their shoulders. So when it comes to any type of throwing uh, or just overhead athletes in general, first and foremost, often the good ones will have a crap ton of mobility, right? You don't usually have to do much mobility with a throwing athlete, whether that's a volleyball player, um, a baseball player, or anything like that. The good ones, at least, right? Mm -hmm. Just because they're often more so on that Gumby side where they have a lot of mobility. Um, so more so your warmups are going to be geared towards stability. So we're going to want to do a few different exercises that will help increase our control of the motion that we do have. So there's a couple of different motions that you can do. And again, the goal during the warmup isn't to tire the athlete out at all, because our goal is to make sure that we're able to perform to our greatest potential during training or the game. But you can do a couple of different exercises to really enhance that awareness of their positioning. Um, I love things with bands because they're usually simple to do. You can have them, you know, you can do them with a partner. You can do them with yourself. Um, for example, things like a W. You can do like a cheerleader where you're pulling the band opposite directions. Um, and then you can also do one. And even if you don't have anything to tie it to, you can have another uh, like a partner hold the band. And it's the row, hold it, rotation, hold it, press, hold it. And then the great thing about with a thrower is that you can either come back down to the 90, rotate forward, or you can do a really slow eccentric, which is also going to mimic that sort of motion that they come down through when they're either hitting the volleyball or throwing a ball with a baseball or softball player. Oh. Um, and just like a few sets of that. And the, the key is not the, the fast. You always see athletes that come up and they're just like yanking on the, the bands. You know, you're going to go fast whenever you're doing the actual movements of the sport, but going slow and controlled to sort of prime those muscles and turn them on will enhance control and then get to the faster stuff of, you know, going back and forth with volleyball, throwing a ball, things like that. Perfect. So then I assume the same concepts apply for lower body as well. So maybe like uh, a squat, driving the knees out, working that control, that slow tempo, like three seconds, five seconds down, five yeah. seconds up, same thing. Well, especially with a volleyball player. I mean, you're in a squat the entire game almost, right? Yeah. So what's our, our, our goal is to enhance our control of that squat. So putting like a hip circle band around the knees, and just doing some like really slow tempo to squats to get the glutes turned on, maybe some like band walks, single leg kickouts aside, because again, while you are in a squat, you're also moving laterally a lot or making quick agility type changes. So being sure that we're enhancing our control of single leg so that you can then cut and still have good awareness can be key as well. For sure, for sure. Uh, are you familiar with peppering? Uh, in baseball terms, yes. Uh, okay. So this is volleyball. It's basically just hitting a volleyball back and forth between your partner is really all that is. Okay. So a lot of times I'll have them warm up banded while peppering. I like so that. I, yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. I wasn't sure. Yeah. Cause then they still try to keep the knees out. There's still I think that. anytime you can, you can put like bands on players to have them do like a sports specific type movement. But then also it, the idea behind a band is it's RNT, reactive neuromuscular training. So you're putting them in a confined uh, zone where it's trying to pull their body into an unnatural position. And you're not even usually cueing them. You're just telling them maybe one or two different things and letting their body react to the band pull. Cool. 
I love it. Um, thank you for that. Are there any, so aside from a warm up mm -hmm. volleyball athletes, you know, like banded external rotation, maybe at the end of a workout or anything like that, any workouts like that, that you would really uh, recommend to strengthen that shoulder girdle or anything like that? So the, the big thing to understand is that while we're like external rotations are great, they're also performed right here, right? Sure. And volleyball doesn't, isn't performed all right here unless you're down low for a ball, sure. a lot of them up high. So making sure that we're also doing things that are in that elevated position so that we can enhance our control right there. Now, you, I don't, I'm not saying we need to do like loaded snatches or anything like that, but you know, kettlebell carries here or even here with a light weight to like work on your enhancement of your control and strength in that position, I think it'd be helpful just cool. because I think shoulder issues for volleyball players are probably just as common as shoulder issues for baseball players. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a big fan of like the kneeling windmill even Perfect. that yep. you teach and like I do a lot of carries carries are like some of my favorite you know I think the hardest the hardest thing about training especially youth athletes is just helping them realize the importance of these movements that oh for are, sure you know like explaining these concepts is definitely like they're like I should just be hitting hard and just jumping on things that's <laughs> how I you know so yeah. like for um sure. So I love that uh, you're breaking that down. So I appreciate that. Um, as far as jumping goes, mm -hmm. do you have any top jumping workouts or go-to workouts that you think are uh, necessities for a, for a jump training program? I think the biggest thing is first and foremost, I mean, we're often doing squatting. I mean, in doing things with like bands around the knees to work on the control. The biggest thing I would say is, is having two things. First and foremost, slow controlled tempo double leg squats and maybe even if it's just like a warm-up because that slow controlled nature is going to really enhance awareness and control of the body through a full range of motion because what's the thing that we see often is those valgus knees collapse so slow tempo descent slow tempo ascent um, and then single leg work so the touchdown squat is huge i can't tell you the amount of athletes that come to me with lower body issues and I ask them to do a single leg squat and it just looks like crap. So being able to supplement with some touchdown squats and I mean, practical, you're in a gym, you don't have access to the weight room, get them on the first step of the bleacher, right? That's maybe a foot, two feet. You know, that should be something that any athlete can do a slow tempo squat, touch the bottom, come back up, things like that. You could easily do, even if you're not in the weight room that day. Cool. Love it. Um, are you familiar, familiar with Ryan Flaherty? It sounds familiar. He's one of the trainers at Nike anyway. So he talks a lot about like the hex bar deadlift. Mm. And a lot of times he'll have do a concentric only lift and then dropping from the top. He said, mm. he claims that it increases your mass specific force. So there's less hypertrophy, more force product production. Mm. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Every single lift is just a means to an end. And the, the big thing that I try not to focus on is being like, this is the, this is the game changer. This is the one thing, because when you are devising a strength training program, you're not, you're never just doing one lift. You know, an athlete doesn't go into the gym and just do one lift. Mm -hmm. it, it's about how things fit into a regimented program, because I would say the descent is just as important for enhancing control and games don't, you know, athletic movement isn't just concentric. Sure, right. your, your, your jump is to a point, but you have to eccentrically load to store that energy before you unleash it into a concentric. So it, I would say it's a similar argument to people that are like, oh, well, what about the research that shows that quarter squats can increase vertical jump height? Okay, well, that doesn't mean I'm having all my weightlifters do or basketball players do only quarter squats. Sure, if it maybe fits within, you know, a specific training program, but I'm still having them do full depth squats mm -hmm. for their anatomy, you know. Mm -hmm. So I would say, you know, if, if you wanted to experiment with a concentric only, you know, hex bar, make sure that you're still doing some con some eccentric loading as well within that specific movement pattern. Okay, cool. 
Thank you. Yeah. Um, oh, so I am going to go a little bit of Stu McGill and ask. So I know he has this, you know, there's like a, uh, maybe like a continuum of stiffness versus mobility. Yes. And like, you know, if you've got a football player, they need less mobility because they need to create a lot of stiffness versus, mm -hmm. you know, so as you know, playing volleyball, would you say that there's a point of diminishing return for mobility to performance or the more mobility is better? Uh, it's, and this is what Stu loves, it's tuned mobility. Because think about it like this, if more mobility would be, lead you to be that Gumby type athlete. Right. And I mean, I stretched some Gumby shoulders and literally it's like, you know, their hand can reach down there. We've got 200 degrees of external rotation. Well, if they have too much mobility, it could lead them to not have enough control of the motion they do have. And then you're just at increased risk of injury. Or you're just that player that's just flopping around and can't create a lot of strength and power because yes, you need a lot of mobility to wind up because it's a lot of elastic energy, mm -hmm. but too much mobility leads someone to be um, not powerful. So it's sort of, you have to take it as a, a case by case basis and look at an athlete, assess their mobility. Okay. You're great. I don't need to be doing any mobility work with you. I need to be doing control work with you and your enhancement of strength and, and speed and power. This athlete, eh, you're so-so. Let's do a little mobility work. You're going to get a little power work. This athlete, okay, you came in. You're just a, you know, you're a, a workhorse. Like you've got, you know, the crazy big legs. You're a strong athlete. Your mobility is a little, needs a little bit of work. So that athlete's going to need a little bit more mobility and maybe less time under the barbell kind of thing. Sure. A lot of times, that being said, I do like to um, like open up range of motion. So like if we're going sure. overhead, even like mobilizing the lats a little bit, which sure. so then would you say to do a mobility to open up that end range and then strengthen that position after as like a like a pre like a warm up or something along those lines? So that's where I love like using screens to see if that person needs anything. So for example, in the book, in the shoulder chapter, there's like that wall screen where you're sitting and sure. touching the wall. Yep. If an athlete can hit that easy, they don't need to be doing any lat work. Even if they feel stiff in the lats, that's probably protective stiffness because they don't own that motion. Mm, okay. They can get there, but they don't own it. So in, instead of like doing some soft tissue work for that person, I would maybe have them do like two Turkish get-ups, right? Because they're working through a full range of motion and all of a sudden they're like, oh, I don't feel stiff there anymore. And now I have access to this full range of motion. Mm -hmm. So I would say there's the difference between a flexibility exercise and maybe a mobility exercise because the mobility isn't always stretching. Sometimes it's just enhancing our coordination and control of specific ranges of motion. So right. sometimes, for example, let's take lower body. Um, you come in and the athlete's like, oh, I just feel like my, my calves and my quads are really tight. Well, I could spend a minute doing calf stretches, foam roll the calves and quads, or I could just have them take a deep goblet squat and sit down into the bottom of a deep squat for a minute. Mm -hmm. Now I've enhanced their mobility, their access to that full range of motion, but I didn't actually stretch or do mobility drills. It may be needed for one person, the other person that just sort of need to enhance their ability to get into that motion through mm -hmm. movement. Cool. Cool. Yeah, that's super helpful. Thank you. Um, there's two paths that I definitely want to, to go down. So you kind of yeah. like touched a little bit of both. Um, mobility screen. Mm -hmm. I for sure want to talk about that, like a, just a general mobility screen that, um, you know, basically using basically directly out of Kelly Starrett's work, uh, the seven archetypes of movement is basically my initial assessment. So um, that's kind of where I typically start. Uh, is there anything in addition? So like, I'll basically have somebody run through a squat, trying to get their hips to knees in depth. I'll look at the single leg, like a lunge position, hinge, overhead, just hang. So I'll just run through those ranges of motion. Is there anything in a mobility screen that you think is super important to be like, 
you know, and in a group setting, like it, like it's more challenging to do in a group setting when you have like a team of athletes, mm -hmm. but, um, really like any mobility thing that you can think of where it's like, okay, most people are missing this and this is a great screen for it. Uh, certainly. Yeah. I mean, I think like the five inch wall screen for getting mm -hmm. that knee over the toe is a really easy one to just sort of expose, Hey, you don't have excellent mobility. And, yeah. uh, especially in volleyball players, because I see a crap ton of sprained ankles. And then what do a lot of volleyball players do is they just wear those big clunky, like ankle yeah. braces. Oh, it's ridiculous. So, I, I hate mean, it. Yeah, I you're going to see so many limited ankle range of motion, which is then going to decrease their ability to get into a deep squat. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be one of your big uh, weak links, I would think. Yep, yep. And that being said, that actually is a perfect tie into really the, the other half of that question or really like um, is ankles, okay? Uh, I know dorsiflexion is a huge piece of the puzzle. And I know a lot of people with a lot of scar tissue or like we can hammer all kinds of ankle dorsiflexion. And sometimes it just doesn't seem to get better. Like, yep. you know, how, like I've done where their foot's on a plate with the banded distraction, they're going, they're lunging forward with a weight, with like a kettlebell, like we've done all of it, like all kinds, like, is there any other keys to opening that up? So one of the biggest things I always ask people who have limitations in ankle mobility that will not get better, even though they're doing a crap ton of ankle mobility work, is I ask them how often throughout the day are they barefoot? And as weird as that sounds, foot stability has a direct connection with ankle mobility. That's that joint by joint connection. Mm -hmm. So if you have a stiff ankle and you don't ever look at your foot, you may never be realizing the big issue because yes, ankle mobility plays a huge part as far as improving your joint glide, the ability to use a banded joint mobilization, soft tissue mobilization to the calf, but a very weak foot will often be a risk factor for limited ankle mobility. Mm -hmm. Meaning the ankle mobility stiffness is a compensation for the body not having access to what its foot should be doing. And when we go throughout our day and wear these horrible shoes for our feet, like Nikes that just pinch your toes together, you know, or you have uh, a ton of, uh, of toe lift, you know, with a toe spring in the front side of the shoe, the foot reacts and becomes weakened. Sure. And, and we see these compensations off the chain. So I see a lot of people that move to like more of a barefoot type shoe or a wider toe box shoe, or just start going barefoot more often throughout their day. And all of a sudden their ankle mobility starts to improve. Mm. Not because they've done more ankle mobility work, but because they've started to allow their body to move in a way that it was designed to. Sure, love it. And then I'll love also ask them in the same sense, how often are you sitting in a deep squat throughout the day? Because we often assume that doing 10 minutes of mobility work for the ankle is enough to see these long lasting changes. So you need to be using your ankle mobility often throughout the day. So I'll have athletes, maybe if they have limited mobility, do their mobilization a few times throughout the day and then try to clock themselves and just sit in a deep squat. It can be a galba squat and grab onto a rig or use your backpack. Let's sit in that bottom of the deep squat for a couple minutes throughout the day, cumulative, and cool. have access to that full range of motion. Yeah, awesome. Love it. Um, I actually have a, have you ever heard of like a rock mat or anything like that? Rock mat? Rock mat. I think no. I've heard of that. What's up? So I don't know. It's This is actually brand new to me. I haven't made one, but essentially, if you basically think of a mat with rocks on it so unstable okay. surfaces and then you can do like balance work there because your foot is designed to be a mobile adapter and mm -hmm. a rigid lever so it just allows for that mobile adapter to like okay okay balance. i don't know i mean like i said i haven't used one or made one or anything but i just saw it and i'm like huh, yeah. that's interesting because i know our feet are designed to be able to adapt to what we're standing on yeah, I, I think the big thing really, I mean, yeah, you can make something like that for sure. 
is is just the most simple thing is just getting out of your shoes more often. Like I'm never in shoes when I'm home. I'm always walking around barefoot, which my wife is like, that's so dirty. Like you're going outside to take the trash out, put your shoes on. I'm like, I'm not going to walk over any nails or anything like that. You know, I'm always out of my shoes. Someone made a joke the other day. I put up a video on Instagram from me in clinic where like literally I have to wear dress clothes. And they're like, oh, it's so weird. Usually you're in shorts and no shoes on. And, you know, in all the videos, just because like that, my foot has changed over the last like 10 years because I've been barefoot more often. And then I just wear my Olympic lifting shoes when I'm doing Olympic weightlifting. Yep. Absolutely. I cannot agree more. I'm, I'm barefoot. Also, I walk in the snow barefoot, even like, I just, <laughs> you know, uh, and honestly, it's funny because growing up, I've just always been barefoot for some reason. Yeah. Like I've always been, I don't know. That was just my go-to yeah. and I've always had, I haven't had any like serious, serious injuries. Mm-hmm. And like looking back now, now that I'm getting more understanding of biomechanics and things like that, I'm like, man, I really think that played a big part into my just success with not being injured. So, so many people, they, we just forget about our feet because we put shoes on them. Mm-hmm. You know, we forget how important the mechanics of the foot are. It's the yeah. base to our, it's the base to our pyramid. Yep. And, and too often we want to just throw some fancy shoes on and think that that's the way to excel yeah and in addition to that even like the sensory input that we get from our feet also dude i yeah i exclusively squat barefoot right now yeah Um, and sometimes i'll put on like i'll I'll put on the the, like barefoot athletics ursus shoe just because they're super wide toe box if i were in a place where i have to wear shoes but other than that like i'm always barefoot yeah love it love it um sweet well this has already been super helpful um okay so next i wanted to cover training days versus recovery days typically how many of each what those might look like i know there's all a lot of times people are even over training under recovered so i'd love to hear your thoughts on that So it's all going to be based on the individual and their like workload tolerance because you'll get some athletes. What what level of volleyball are you coaching? Anywhere from high school up to uh, pro. Okay, so obviously you're seeing a wide range. So you're going to see athletes that have been probably playing that elite level for years, day in and day out, you know, all across the calendar year that can tolerate a high workload. Then you're going to get some athletes that are only seasonal, I'm sure. So you're going to have to, I, I think it's all about pivoting and finding what each person needs. Mm-hmm. Um, but as far as, yeah, I think that you said, you said it right. You know, we're often over training and under recovering. Um, so just enhancing that off day and making sure that we're doing things. Shirley Sarman put it a good way. Our goal with recovery day should be to undo what the training program does to us. So if we think about it, if we're doing a crap ton of jumping and a lot of, you know, if you think about it, like the, the hitting action in volleyball is similar to the throwing action in baseball. So we're getting a lot of anterior chain. So making sure that we're doing some light posterior chain stuff. We're working on, you know, recovering our, our uh, you know, anterior chain as far as quads and everything like that, just because of the force is placed on them. Um, things like that can be really, really helpful. Cool. Cool. So what's a, uh, what's a training, uh, I'm sorry, a recovery day typically look like for you? So for me, I think like a 10 minute walk is going to be huge. I, you know, try to go take my dog for a 10 to 15 minute walk. Barefoot. Um, <laughs> no. yeah, I love, uh, I personally love using a little bit of technology. Now I know not everyone has access to it, but like I'll use like a Mark Pro NMES device. Um, I even use a little bit of blood flow restriction training right now as well. Uh, just passively where I'll inflate the cuffs, which I'm actually coming out with a blog article soon on that. So people can be educated a little bit more on that. Um, but I mean, besides that, just getting up and moving, that's the biggest thing is too often we think recovery is just like passive. Now it's not always a, a, a workout, but it should be like movement, you know, sitting in a deep squat, uh, doing some world's greatest stretching, opening your body, you know, a little bit of foam rolling, things like that. Sure. I love that. 
as far as that goes, would you recommend doing that like right when you wake up, like first thing in the morning? Every like typically every day, I like to do some sort of movement. It could just be like some random animal flow or world's greatest stretch or anything like that. I mean, I think um, it depends on the person's schedule. You know, like on some days, like I wake up and it's on like Wednesdays, one of my off days of training. And it's wake up, it's eat, and it's straight into the work day. Like I've got patients that start at 7 30 in the morning. So I usually don't get to like more of an active recovery type day until the early afternoon. But I'm also like, while I'm seeing patients, like doing some exercises with them sometimes. So I start right. that way as well and work it into my day. Yeah. Yeah. But it's definitely a, an advantage for sure to, to be able to move with your client. Yeah, for sure. Um, random question how often do you work biceps do i work biceps or just how uh, often because i know they have some this many days problems. is what i work biceps uh seven <laughs> days a week is what my wife would like me to work biceps <laughs> so i'm a huge proponent of uh if you're an athlete you train movements you don't train muscles sure now if you want to get some bicep curls in and that but i always say as an athlete, your goal should be to enhance movement quality because that's the, that's the way in which we enhance performance. And often we will see a lot of very ripped athletes who appear to have done some bodybuilding. Sure. But often it's more of an indication that they have their diet toned in and they do a good job of enhancing the type of quality training that they are doing, not that they are doing bodybuilding type movements. Sure. Yeah. You know, sometimes I'll use biceps as like a supplemental just because, you know, I've heard that they got some protective properties against like tendonitis in the elbow, things like that. I would say no to that. Okay. Yeah. I, I have not seen like distal biceps tendon issues are often a result of problems at the shoulder joint, not mm. because the biceps are weak. Okay. Yeah. Good to know. Cool. Well, thank you for that. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, since you did mention diet and everything, um, you know, I don't want to get too deep into diet right now, but really, do you use any specific protocols as far as like even like intermittent fasting or time restricted eating or, you know, anything like that? Any specifics that you're like, most of my athletes need X, Y, or Z, or this is the strategy that I like to so I really don't get into diet too much with my athletes just for the sake of like, I know that I don't know what I don't know. Sure. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. I went to school for seven years to know physical therapy and like touch on nutrition, yeah. but that's it. So like, I'll have the conversation sometimes with my athletes, like, are you getting enough protein during your day? Just because the demands on muscle protein synthesis and making sure that we're enhancing the recovery process is so key. Uh, especially some athletes that don't eat enough protein throughout the day, that can be a hindrance to recovery. Mm -hmm. uh, but besides that, I really don't touch on nutrition too much. I'd say the, the most basics of what I get into is telling athletes that they need to get enough good whole foods throughout the day. And if you're making enough good quality choices throughout the day, at least from my standpoint, you're on the right path. But I always tell people like there's much more knowledgeable people out there that can answer nutrition questions because as far as like intermittent fasting, you know, what about being doing keto versus this or carb loading like that's way out of my expertise level I, uh, I only have so much brain power throughout my day. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, I, I appreciate being dialed in and I just brought it really it just yeah. sparked the question. No, it's, it's a great question because I have a lot of people that ask me that and I'm just like, I, I don't know. Talk, yeah. talk to talk to Lane Norton. Talk to you know all those guys out there that I mean that's their that's their realm. One hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. I totally totally agree, and uh, it just kind of popped in my head. So, oh, we, you know, as far as all of the base questions that I really had, like you hit a lot of them. Is there any other like training modalities or anything that you think we should? you know like that i should really just add in or anything like that that we have haven't really discussed or based off of the questions that i asked 
nothing really that I can think of. Um, I will say um, I'm excited to get this blood flow restriction training um, blog out for people just because it's something that I've been getting into a lot more the last year and have been starting to formulate my thoughts on how to teach it to the world um, a little bit better because I, I think it does have a lot of great application, especially for athletes who are in the middle of a training uh, or a competition cycle, for example, in the middle of a season that like, you're also not going to want to like squat and deadlift real heavy mm. the day before a volleyball match. Right. Sure. Interesting. But, yeah. So you can use blood flow restriction as a way to enhance strength, enhance muscular development without training heavy. And your body's going to believe that it's training heavy. You like trick your brain into thinking that it's working harder than it really is. Hmm. I cannot wait to, to read that article because yeah. typically the only time that I recommend occlusion training or blood flow restriction is post-op to like all the post-op people because for those same exact reasons. Exactly. Uh, so I can't wait to see the performance side. Exactly. Uh, so it's got, I'm going to be talking about, yes, the injury side of things, but then also like there's parts on like how, like the, the banged up athlete, right? How you're, you can't handle training heavy six days a week like you could when you were 20. So how can you use BFR to enhance or optimize your training? Okay. So it's got, yeah, different, different ways of going about it, but from the, sort of the, the platform that I talk about to the world, which is optimizing recovery and enhancing performance. Cool. I love it. Um, do you use a lot of voodoo floss or anything like that in your clinic? I don't use voodoo floss um, just for the sake we don't have any. I mean, okay. would I use it if I had some? Maybe. Um, you know, when we um, we're using mobility often with like soft tissue work, maybe like some foam rolling and stuff like that. But um, I don't do any voodoo floss. I don't have a problem with it. I just personally don't use a lot of it. Sure. Sure. Um, what are your thoughts on like percussion guns? Uh, great question. I think they're just a tool in the toolbox. Uh, a percussion gun is like a really fancy foam roller that you don't need to lay on the ground for. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Is it worth $500? No. Um, you know, is it, is it nice to have sometimes if you're like chilling on the couch and want to get a little bit of soft tissue work in? Yeah. Um, but I think where people go wrong is they're like, oh, this is going to be the best thing ever. Like I use it every single day before I warm up. And sometimes I'm like, all right, well, if, if you have to do all this soft tissue work every time before you warm up, are you maybe not moving well enough throughout your day? In the same way, I would have that conversation about a foam roller, mm -hmm. you know? So a percussion gun is basically just like a high tech foam roller. It's yeah. got its place, but it shouldn't be, shouldn't have to be something that you use every day and shouldn't cover up other issues mm -hmm. that you may be addressing. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. And, um, you know, another thing, and now there's different research, but thoughts on icing and like the whole rice method post-workout or, or, yeah. Yeah. Have you read the last chapter in my book? Not yet. Oh, it's all uh, about ice, man. Okay, shoot. Uh, yeah. I was trying to avoid everything that was in your book for the most no, part. No, it's, all, it's all good. Yeah, yeah. Read the last chapter of my book. It'll explain it. It'll explain it well. Okay, cool. Well, uh, you know, yeah, I'll, I'll certainly get into that. And uh, cool. Well, I'll definitely do that. Um, one thing, actually, since this is a question that I missed, yeah. I'm kind of going back to to jumping concepts or I know there's certain things online where people are going to like deep end ranges and strengthening. So even like the knees shooting past the toes and working that in range from a strength standpoint, do you think that has its values? Cause I know you have your like step down where you're mm -hmm. stepping down to the side, hinging at the hips. I've seen some where the knee shoots really far forward and, uh, yeah, what are your thoughts on that? My thing is always when you're doing a squat, a squat always starts at the hips, no sure. matter what. And then from there, the knees will go where they need to. Mm -hmm. So if you're doing a really deep squat, the knees will go forward. They have sure. to. Yeah. And you can make it a little bit more knee dominant, but I'm all about training the body in the way in which it wants to stay balanced. 
So you'll see certain people that will just drive the knees forward because they're like, we need to train knees over toes. We need to train knees over toes. The knees will go over the toes. So we shouldn't fear it. But I also don't think that we necessarily need to train in a way that's trying to just jam it forward every single time, because often you find yourself in an unbalanced position yeah. when you're doing that. Mm -hmm. So training to stay balanced. And if you're doing a deep squat, your knees will go forward. So it's one of those things that you'll get it, but it shouldn't be the emphasis of it. Sure. Or you can do like, I mean, think about like a Bulgarian split squat with more of a closed stance. Your knees will go forward. Yeah. They have to, to stay balanced and squat down. Yeah. But I'm not going to do it with the emphasis of like driving my knee really far forward. I'm going to say stay balanced full foot through the middle of your foot, then squat down. Sure. And I know most people probably have a more quad dominant or knee formant forward movement pattern anyways exactly that's the big thing is is we got to think about well in the grand scheme of things i already have a problem with most people going too far forward right now you get the every once in a while you get the person that's like oh my trainer told me to never let my knees go past my toes so i've been squatting with a vertical shin for 20 years okay that person could probably benefit from me just teaching them balance and sure. allowing the knees to go forward but for the far majority of people we get a problem with people already being way too knee dominant and being off balance and not having control of their posterior chain. So that's often the, the route in which, I mean, I have found to be very beneficial in my own training with people for 100%. I could not agree more. It's usually teaching the exact opposite for sure. Yeah. Um, how much do you do any like neuro type type training with your athletes to so I had a conversation a couple of weeks ago and they've talked a lot about like neuro, like just creating a, let's say faster engine to where, I don't know, I, I'm not even, I had no real idea about the research or anything like that, but mm -hmm. they had somebody doing push-ups, for example. And then after the push-up, they would do what's called like a pencil push-up, which is like a neuro type exercise. Interesting. And then they were able to do more push-ups after. I'm not aware of that technique. Um, I do know the brain is, is very interesting in the way in which we can train it. Um, the way in which I have seen some research is just through like imagery training. Mm -hmm. So like first and third person, imagining yourself doing a motion and then seeing actual improvement in that technique and performance. Um, for example, I think uh, there's a piece of research that looked at tennis and they had three groups of people and they were all doing forearm and, and backhand uh, training for uh, like six weeks. And then they took these three groups of people and they had one group just go, go do like math problems in their head. So they were still doing some type of mental challenge. And then one group was told to, to perform third person uh imagery training of those skills and then the other one was told to do first person training of the skills and the one group uh i can't remember which one it was but the two groups that were doing visual training improved their accuracy during the skills compared to the group that was just doing math problems in their head showing that visual imagery of a specific skill can enhance your performance of that skill. Sure. Um, but yeah, that's that's to the extent of, I think the, the neuro actual changes. That yeah. I'm okay, yeah, yeah, I know. And that was a whole new concept. And we were trying to like figure out a volleyball program and they're really into the neuro side of things. I'm really into like the mechanics side of things. Yeah. So they're like, oh, we need to train more neuro. And I'm like, we need to first figure out the mechanics. And it was just kind of like a, yeah. interesting conversation to where I was like I don't know the end result and I'd love to uh, hear your yeah your no I, I would probably ask those people just for some for some research based on what they've what they're basing their concepts on uh yeah. be interesting to dive into I, I haven't heard about that with push-ups but that's interesting. Yeah. yeah 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 super interesting cool man well I think all of the training and things you've covered so I definitely appreciate all of this and um welcome man how did you get so you know how'd you blow up on instagram <laughs> uh 
Um, I was posting content every single day for sure. um, from 2015 on when I started things. Um, and I just, I really enjoy what I'm doing. So it doesn't, it never felt like it was a job to have to do stuff. I know some people that are like, Oh, I got to get the post done for today. You know right. what I'm saying? So yeah. it's like, I would much rather be doing that than paperwork or anything, which is probably why I got behind in a lot of my paperwork for, for work. Um, but it's, I mean, it's a, it's definitely a passion of mine. So I think it was easy to create a lot of content just because it just came naturally. And then just, yeah, every single day, just posting content and seeing what works, what doesn't work and trying yeah. new things. Yeah. 100%. I mean, yeah. Providing lots of value and you, you read yeah. that you reap the rewards from it hopefully so definitely appreciate all the work that you do and um welcome in yeah man uh it's been super helpful uh do you mind so do you mind if i put this on youtube i probably am not gonna like i'm not gonna like share it or anything like oh, that i just sure. want it for sure. my for yeah. my like yeah share so it around not a problem anywhere i mean it's basically we basically just did a mini podcast so yeah, yeah. Share it cool so for me. yeah well i appreciate that and um yeah. Well, thank you. Is there anything else You're that welcome, uh, we should cover or I'll let you get back to your morning? <laughs> yeah, man. Just uh, let me know if you ever have any questions in the future. I'm always here to help. Cool. Well, thank you. And uh, one, I'm coming out to uh, the, the city museum one day. Okay. I hear, I hear good things about it. So yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. There's a, eventually we'll, we'll have our downtown opened up and it'll be a fun place to go to again. Yeah. 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 Cool, brother. Cool, man. Well, All right. You, so you have much. a good rest of your day. You as well. See you, man.